Hi Bobcats! In this video we're going to take a look at heating and cooling curves. We're going to look at the different uh, phases of matter that are present in the different portions and we'll talk in general about how you would um, do calculations based on these curves. Um, then in the next video we'll work an actual example of one of those calculations. Our objectives are to interpret heating curves and to calculate the enthalpy changes associated with those heating curves. The uh, shape of these heating curves is very distinctive and it is very standard to give test items on heating curves where the states of matter are not labeled. You are expected to know where you find a solid, a liquid, or a gas on these heating curves and you are also expected to be able to identify where melting is taking place as well as where boiling is taking place. This is an example of a heating curve. Uh, typically what you have on the vertical axis of the curve is the temperature on this particular diagram that's in degrees Celsius. On the horizontal axis, you'll have something along the lines of heat added. Um, usually this curve or this axis is labeled kind of vaguely like this. Um, the way I actually conceptualize the horizontal axis is in terms of time. I imagine an experiment where you take your sample and you stick it on a hot plate and that hot, that hot plate gives a constant rate of heat to your sample. So it's continuously adding um, heat to the sample and as time goes by, the sample is responding by changing temperature. Um, the coldest form of a sample is the solid. So when this heating curve starts, what you have present is all solid. And as you add heat to the sample, the temperature rises until we hit this point right here where the temperature plateaus. And even though we are adding heat, the temperature is remaining constant. What's happening here is that every bit of energy that's being added at this constant temperature goes into converting the solid into a liquid by breaking apart those particles. That thermal energy is counteracting the intermolecular forces so that the particles can start to move around. So at, at this horizontal plateau, we have melting taking place. And so we actually have two phases present. We have the solid phase turning into the liquid liquid phase. And so then in this, um, once every bit of the solid has turned into a liquid, if you continue adding heat, the temperature of that liquid rises. So this next sloped portion is where we have the liquid phase. And so as you continue adding uh, energy, the temperature rises until we hit this next horizontal plateau. And at this next horizontal plateau, every little bit of energy that you add instead of changing the temperature causes some of the liquid molecules to turn into a gas. So what we have happening right here is boiling or vaporization. And so this is where we have a liquid turning into a gas. And when we get up to the point where all of the liquid has been turned into a gas, now the temperature of the gas can continue to rise. Um, let's see if we can read some important data off of here. Uh, if I gave you a curve like this and I asked you what is the boiling point of this substance, I'd expect you to look for the temperature where this second, where, where the later horizontal plateau occurs, which is somewhere between 75 and 100. So I'd guess that might be something like about 90 degrees or so. So whatever this temperature right here is, I'm just going to say that's about 90 degrees. Um, if I asked you what is the melting point, it would be the temperature at which melting is taking place, which is the cooler temperature plateau, which is down here between 25 and 50. So I'd guess that that's somewhere roughly maybe 30 degrees. That's just an approximation reading it off of this axis. Um, typically on these curves, 
And the solid, liquid, and gas phases are not actually labeled. It's understood the coldest phase is the solid, the intermediate phase is the liquid, and the hottest phase is the gas. Um, any of the slanted portions have a single phase, just a solid or a liquid or a gas. And then those two horizontal plateaus have two phases present. They have both a solid and a liquid when it's melting, or both a liquid and a gas when it's boiling. Um, when I ask multiple choice questions about this, I might ask you to tell me what the boiling point is or what the melting point is. I might ask you where is, um, which of these um, regions are single phase regions versus which are, are two phase regions. Um, when I ask a question like that, I typically label the um, curve, like the, the lowest temperature part here would be answer A, this next horizontal plateau would be B, the um, liquid phase would be labeled C, the boiling plateau would be D, and the gas um, increasing in temperature would be E. So I just say A, B, C, D, E, which of these um, line segments has one phase present? And the correct answer would be A, C, and E. Or which of these line segments has two phases present? The correct answer would be B and D. I might ask something like, which one of these line segments represents only the state of matter in which the gas, oh, whoops, I want to use the word gas, sorry. Which one of these line segments represents the state of matter in which the particles are farthest apart from one another? That would be answer E. Um, I like questions like that because it makes you combine what you know about heating curves uh, with what you know about the particle nature of the states of the matter. In the 1142 lab, you'll do an experiment with the reverse of a heating curve, which is known as a cooling curve. So at the highest temperature area, you start with a gas. As it cools down, you get condensation. Um, and then you have the liquid phase cooling off. Um, and then you have freezing. And then finally, you have the solid phase at that lowest temperature. Now, in the experiment in the lab, you're not looking at all of these phase transitions of a gas turning into a liquid turning into a solid. Um, instead, you're going to focus just on this elbow where the liquid is cooling down and then it turns into a solid or it freezes. And if we blow up just that little elbow, um, you get a, a nice cooling curve that looks something like this. You you can read the freezing point, which is the same temperature as the melting point, just reverse direction. Um, you can read that just by reading the temperature of that horizontal plateau as that's marked. Um, lab is always a little bit more complicated than theory due to our experimental setup. We tend to see a bit of curvature rather than a nice sharp elbow. So um, what we end up doing is doing a little bit of curve fitting um, to the linear portion of our data. Um, we we just extend the, the linear portion um, mathematically. We extend uh, the linear portion here mathematically, and we look for the temperature at which those two uh, lines intersect. And Yes, well, I had left a reminder here on the slides for me. Um, this curve shape is unique, whether it's a heating curve or a cooling curve. It just depends on whether the temperature is going up or the temperature is going down. I would expect you on a quiz or a test to understand which states of matter are present in each region, even if they are not labeled. The types of problems that you'll be asked to calculate off of heating curves um, require you to understand how you would calculate uh, the heat associated um, with each region of the curve. If we're talking about a horizontal portion, that's going to represent a phase change. That's going to be either vaporization or fusion. And in order to calculate the uh, delta H, or in order to calculate the 
heat associated with that, you'll need to take the delta H of that transition, either delta H of vaporization or delta H of fusion, and multiply it by the amount of material that you have. If we're talking about a sloped portion, the temperature is changing, and we've got to throw that delta T into our calculation. Um, that's where uh, the slope portions are where you're heating or possibly cooling, uh, just a single phase, just a solid, just a liquid, or just a gas. Um, and so to finish this calculation, you also are going to need the specific heat of the substance. That's a concept back from Gen Chem 1 about how a um, material responds um, to adding or removing heat in terms of how much the temperature changes. So we're going to need that specific heat, we're going to need the delta T, and of course we need to know how much stuff we have. So the Q for any of the slope portions will be given by the amount of material we have multiplied by the constant, such as the specific heat, and then multiplied by delta T, the change in temperature. On the previous slide, I was very vague about the equations deliberately because every problem in every textbook that works these problems sets these up just a little bit differently for that constant that we have about how uh, the temperature changes um, in response to adding heat for a particular material. Well, that can be called the heat capacity, the molar heat capacity, the specific heat. Um, the heat capacity is simply defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a material by one Kelvin. Um, so that would be, you know, like you, you have a chunk of iron and it's the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of that entire chunk by one Kelvin. But then we can also give that as the molar heat capacity. Instead of giving it for that chunk of iron, you give it per mole of iron, and then you've got to multiply it times how many moles you have. But it's not standard necessarily to do it per mole. In fact, you often see it per gram. So then you have to multiply the constant, which is given per gram, times the mass in grams, and then times the change in temperature. If, okay, so yeah, these top three things all reply, uh, all apply to the sloped portions uh, or the, the slanted portions. Let me write that up here. Then the bottom two things apply to, or the, the, the next one applies to the horizontal uh, portion. So this is the horizontal. And um, it is, you will sometimes see the, the delta H of fusion or the delta H of vaporization be given per mole of your substance. Sometimes it'll be given per gram. So again, you have to figure out, um, you know, if you're given per mole, you have to multiply by how many moles you have. If you're given per gram, you have to multiply by how many grams there are. And then sometimes these will be given in joules and other times they'll be given in kilojoules. And just to make things worse, if you go and you consult a different textbook or you go and watch a different YouTube video, sometimes these terms are defined differently. Um, I broke this down in terms of specific heat versus heat capacity. Um, I've even seen the term specific heat capacity and it's defined even a little differently than what I have listed here. So the bottom line is pay attention to your units and multiply things together in such a way that your units cancel out. That will get you the right answer. On this slide, I'm just trying to say the same thing one more way. Um, if we're talking about the phase transitions, these are the horizontal plateaus, then Q for these phase transitions will be given by delta H of the transition multiplied by the amount of material. And then if we are talking about the slanted portions, on the slanted portions, we have just a single phase the whole time, no phase transitions, but these single phases are uh, changing their temperature. And so for these single phase regions, we're going to take the amount of material and multiply it by that constant and then multiply all of that by the change in temperature. 
Our objectives here were to interpret heating curves, what's present in each area, where phase transitions are happening, those sorts of things, and then also to set up how to calculate the enthalpy changes associated with the different segments.